All right, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, welcome to this event. This is the Dallas Tagaro Professionals Network uh, International Women's Month um, event. My name is Michael Gabramesco. I am the chair of the DTPN. And I would just like to you know, thank everybody for joining us today. Obviously it's International Women's Month. So we wanna celebrate some of the great achievements that uh, the women in our culture have done and where they're gonna to continue to go. So um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, our first uh, kind of major speaker. Um, her name is uh, uh, Furwani uh, Belai. She's a part of the Tigray Women's um, Association. And um, we'll have her give some inspirational words and then uh, prepare for the rest of the event. So uh, Furwani, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, I am not a professional speaker. Uh, I'm not a politician. I am just um, Tigrawiti who loves her people and her country, soon to be country. Um, so, I understand uh, you want me to speak a little bit about women in, in the revolution. Uh, so before that, I think we need to touch up a little bit. Uh, my phone is falling. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, before I think we need, I, I would like to touch up just a little bit um, about uh, the history of women. Uh, in, in the uh, primitive uh, era, women had big power in society. They were the economy uh, providers. Uh, they were, and they were the, uh, people that raise children. And as a result, children were called by their mothers. Uh, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, <laughs> obviously. Um, uh, but uh, then from then, um, men became uh, powerful. When men became powerful, it was, uh, because of the fact that women had to stay home uh, with children and then being pregnant, that was um, that was a reason for men uh, to go hunting and uh, provide their daily meal. Uh, and uh, it came to uh, to be women staying home, providing, uh, raising their children. And uh, it became to feudalism from, I mean, I'm not going to the steps, uh, but just jumping to feudalism. Um, then when feudalism era came, um, it, women were like um, private uh, property. Uh, the father um, had power on the, on the daughter um, he would choose to marry his child to people that he wanted to marry. And um, a women didn't have property that they owned themselves when they get married, um, unless the father was very rich and had lots of dowries. Uh, but when uh, it, it, then she became the, the husband's position, it was, uh, she was his position. Um, so uh, she had the right to hit her. Um, she had, he had the right to um, abuse her, but, um, and if she divorces, she left without nothing. She didn't have the land that she owned. Uh, um, she didn't have the right of saying, um, this is mine, oh, well, it was, she was a property, basically. 
Um, then if we're going to jump to uh, the revolution, um, this, this being what was going on during the feudalism in Ethiopia, uh, as you know, we are still Ethiopians to this day, um, the Tigrayan women were a part of this uh, operation. Uh, during feudalism, uh, women had no rights, uh, they had no land they owned, they, they had no property, they were on top of what was happening, the national oppression, uh, the women also had a double oppression. So they had to fight as uh, against their nationality oppression, uh, against class oppression, uh, oppression. Uh, but as women, they had to fight um, as for their right to be a woman, to be like persons, um, so to be as human human beings, to have right in society. Um, throughout, uh, then the yeah, I'll get that. Uh, throughout revolution, uh, women had uh, contributed immensely, but it's not told. It's not said. Um, women had uh, supported their husbands. Even if we, if we see from the beginning of democracy in Greek, um, the Athenians had uh, created democracy, but women didn't have democracy. They didn't have rights as women. However, uh, the women had an instrument in supporting her husband uh, to uh, sway his decisions. Uh, then he would go to the to their meeting at and and he would he would put this as his idea. Uh, so uh, even during the democracy uh, era, when they so-called uh, invented democracy, women didn't have democracy. They didn't have right. The democracy didn't apply to them. So, uh, so now uh, going back to Ethiopia, in Ethiopia was the same thing. Uh, women didn't have rights. They didn't have rights. Uh, although um, as Tigrayans, we didn't have rights. Uh, our, to speak in our own language, didn't have rights. To call our own name, we didn't have, uh, we had pressure. We had a pressure to, to we, we indirectly we were assimilated. Indirectly, we were assimilated because we were forced to uh, speak in Amharic. We, we were forced um, to be educated if we got that opportunity in Amharic. So uh, indirectly, we were assimilation. And we, uh, if you are educated, it was easier and nicer for, for that person to speak in Amharic or to have an Amharic name. Uh, so indirectly, uh, we don't say it, we don't uh, call it that, but we were assimilated. So our, even though uh, Tigray was the providers, the provider of uh, what Ethiopia is proud of, uh, Tigray wasn't accepted as one. So women as were the, in the same situation, except they had extra oppression. So uh, when, when uh, the Tigray People's Liberationary Front decided to fight this, to take it heads on, uh, because there was no solution uh, in, in being, uh, not fighting about it, um, they, they decided that they were going to fight for their right, they, for to have democracy, to have the right of speech, to have the right of uh, going to school in their own language, going to court in their own language, um, to have the development because Tigray has been uh, for years and years has been, uh, as the country that was ruling different areas of our world became to a very small country and very weak uh, nation, basically 
uh, be here. Um, so from from this, uh, then they decided, okay, enough is enough. We need to fight for our um, identity, uh, for our rights. Uh, so when they decide to uh, to fight, they made their principle that they're going to recognize women as one part of society. So being one part of society, they, they believe that women are capable of um, accomplishing what the male can accomplish, not by lifting heavy weights, uh, but by being part of society, by participating in all aspects that are important to society and development of society. So uh, 1975, uh, March 18, uh, uh, February 18, I mean, uh, when TPLF uh, picked up the, the gun, uh, they accepted, um, I'm not sure how many uh, months or you know, what, what, what time, but they accepted a woman named uh, Marta. So Marta was the first female fighter. So when, when Martha joined the revolution, then thousands and thousands of women uh, joined the revolution. So 30% uh, of uh, the revolution were women in Tigray. So when, when they were fighting uh, beside their, uh, their brothers, uh, male brothers, they participated in every aspect, like I said, they uh, uh, they participate in the military, uh, just the same. Uh, they participated in uh, education, ed educating uh, the people of Tigray, uh, educating uh, the uh, fighters. Uh, they participated um, in uh, medical. They participated in all uh, society aspects that is required. So um, we also had a female uh, Aragash in the Central Committee. Uh, so um, now uh, we have female uh, military colonels, generals. So they participated in everything. So the revolution was successful because women were part of it, not um, uh, not like you, you can't succeed in society by just by one uh, gender, basically. That's what we saw in, in the revolution of uh, Tigray. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the revolution was successful because um, all uh, of the half the male half part half the, the female part half joined the revolution and they they fought together however uh, even during um, inside the revolution women had to fight extra uh, because for for the, they had to fight the gender uh, revolution uh, that, that is extra just for female so uh, the women of Tigray had uh, uh, accomplished an immense accomplishment, I say, uh, because it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was um, even society, like uh, women wearing pants um, uh, to be seen on the street was, uh, was not acceptable at that time. But through all the struggles, um, they, uh, they became successful and um, yeah, the, that's what I like to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for waiting. I think that was uh, super important to have that context, you know, um, from you went all the way from pretty much the beginning of time until now. Um, and as we look at the theme of this event, we're trying to uh, turn conversation to action and look towards the future. Um, so that was a great setting the stage. Uh, so we appreciate you for doing that. Um, Asmaid, if you don't mind, I think there were some slides I, I skipped over. Uh, maybe we can uh, kind of use those to lead into it. And um, just some quotes uh, that we kind of put together to share 
you know, we realized the importance of our voice when we are silenced. Um, so often you'll hear just across different societies, like, uh, you know, for Wayne, he has kind of alluded to so far, uh, women are silenced, you know, uh, even just not having the ability to vote, to own property, all these different things, um, tremendous limiters. And all of us, you know, we come in the United States or um, what other countries we are outside of where we're from, we're already minorities. So think about being a minority. And then on top of that, you're a woman, that's a double minority. Um, so again, the, the struggle to apply, that's super important. Um, and then, you know, uh, another quote from Hillary Clinton here, women are the largest untapped reservoir of talent in the world. Um, and you'll see some of these uh, male dominated um, fields like engineering uh, that don't have, you know, that representation, but, you know, most of the talent uh, you, that, again, that's untapped is in women. In fact, I think the best selling car that um, any family has bought was designed by a woman engineer, and it's because she knew exactly what families would need. So again, putting those identities together is super important. I think, you know, as we continue to drive that conversation, we'll get there. Um, in fact, you know, if you look in our society, women generally lead a lot of it. Uh, even in our TPN board, um, it's actually almost all women. It's just me and Simon that are the only males. So we like to think it's uh, women run. Um, if we look at our TPN, like national leadership, it's like even higher, it's 80% of women. Um, but then if you look up some of the facts, you know, only 29% of women are reported to be in senior management positions in the workforce today in 2020, um, which is, again, not really that 50-50 split we're looking for. And we know the talent is there. So it's on, on to us to make uh, that um, uh, a reality. And so um, with that, I'll kind of just say, you know, with even within Ethiopia, where we're, where we're at today, you know, um, only... I think it's uh, in the past, only 21% of women were actually getting through primary school. Now in the past three decades, the past three decades, 91% um, of women are able to go through school. So that's uh, a trend in the right direction. And again, you know, we're trying to turn conversation action. So I think it's important that we remember where we've been um, and then try to look forward. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Fevin Gebra Hewitt. She's gonna be our moderator for today. Um, she is super great, um, so she'll she'll take it over. She uh, hosts our guest speaker series uh, in the Dallas TPN. Um, so we've already done uh, two of those so far, and now we'll kick it off to her to, to lead us off here. So Fevin, it's all you. All right, thanks, Michael. Hey, everyone. Uh, like Michael said, I'm Fevin Geber Hewitt. I represent the T DTPN Dallas chapter as the networking slash mentor chair. Um, so tonight I'm actually joined with five amazing panelists with diverse backgrounds. You can see them on your screen. Um, they're going to be talking about things about what's going back home in Ethiopia, how to maneuver in the professional world, talking about you know honoring women's history slash women, uh, um, International Women's Day. Um, so to start it all off, we're gonna kind of have them introduce themselves. So starting with Mabra Gabra Michael, kind of share who you are and what you represent. Hey, good evening, everyone. I am Mabrat Gebra Mikhail. I'm currently a sales manager with CSX Transportation based in Atlanta, Georgia, and serving as the vice chair of the National Tagato Professionals Network. Thanks, Bevan. All right, Blaine, you can go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Belen and a, I am a mental health professional in Dallas, Texas. And I am also a Dallas member as well. All right, Rama, you're up. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Rama Hagos. I'm a graduate student in the Sociology and Office of Population Research program at Princeton University. And I mostly work on migration, health, racial disparities. And I'm also part of the Dallas chapter. And I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. Betty. Hi guys, um, I'm Betty from Perth, Australia, so the other side of the world. Um, I work in local government and I do community development. Um, I'm a part of the committee in Perth and Australia, and then we've got a global group um, for the movement today. And Hannah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Hannah aka Ruta. Um, I host the Uprooted podcast and I am involved in the Bay Area Tagato community 
Denver community, um, and then also a global working community for the revolution that we're currently in. All right, thank you so much, guys. Um, so those of you who are watching, for the sake of time, we're gonna have them answer um, a handful of generic questions, and then we're gonna dive into personal questions that go into what they're involved in and also what their profession is. Um, so the first question, of course, we can't just ignore what month it is. Um, as we celebrate International Women's Day or Women's History Month, we'd like to ask the panelists, you know, to name a woman who has been the most influential in their life. Um, so Hannah, I see you up on the screen, so you go ahead and take this one. All right, let's see, name a woman. <laughs> you know what? I've been thinking about this a lot lately and I, I'm gonna say my mom. Um, there's plenty of people I probably can choose from, but if I think about, you know, who's really like shaped me and molded me to be the person that I am, that's her. Um, I don't wanna get emotional, <laughs> but it, it is like, I, I, you know, you get older and you start to realize like, that was your biggest role model and inspiration in your life. Um, if you were lucky enough to have, you know, your, your mom present. And for me, I also realized like she was my first teacher. Um, and that's a role that in our, and I feel like in our community that we appreciate a lot, but we don't usually think about our moms like as our teacher. So that's who I would say is, you know, the most influential person for me. All right, Hannah, thank you so much. Um, I guess I'll go with Belen for the second uh, answer. Kind of a hard question to answer. Um, you know, of course my mom, but also too, I like as I progress like in my field, I kind of feel like personally, there's a lot of women that I encounter that impose like different qualities that I like to embody. But in general, I just see a lot of strength and a lot of wisdom that I really, really like, that I really do admire. All right, thank you so much for that, Glenn. Um, so the next question will be, um, how do you approach conflict in the workplace? Um, so I guess the first person I'll go to is Mabrat. Thanks, Beben. Um, ooh, how do you approach conflict in the workplace? So I, I'm a firm believer in addressing you know, any issues or potential conflict head on. I think that is the, the best way to approach any type of conflict. I work in corporate America uh, where there may not be, as Michael had alluded to a lot of the facts, there aren't a lot of women in leadership roles. And a lot of times there are things that are misinterpreted, miscommunicated, just as a result of our perceptions in gender roles, for example. Um, so in the event that I'm faced with a conflict, I, I like to address it directly, but also carefully, you know, I think when folks um, come for you at work, you don't want to react in a way that is negative or that could be harmful or that could really jeopardize your work. Uh, so I think it's, it's a way of kind of approaching it with body language and mind clear of, well, well what do you mean by that? You know, what, why, why would you say something like that? Help me understand. So I think that's how I typically would approach any type of conflict in the workplace. All right, thank you so much, Mabrat. Uh, the next one will go to Rama. Yeah, so it's interesting now, um, I'm a graduate student, but before graduate school, I worked in public policy and exactly like what Mabrat was talking about, how there can be these miscommunications that snowball. And so I always approach those from a very neutral, calm stance of let's just get to the bottom of the issue rather than heightening the situation because, you know, we're humans, we can be very emotional, people can get hurt, their feelings can get hurt, but coming from a calm, how do we move forward position always worked well for me there and also does in graduate school. Well said. Um, so the next question will be, so gender equality at work won't happen without men. How should men be supporting the women that they work with? Now, this question will go to uh, Betty. Thank you. Um, I would say even outside of the workplace, if men are trying to support 
Um, it's knowing your privilege and giving us the voice to speak and not deciding for yourself is probably the biggest thing. Um, and also, yeah, using your privilege, um, but ensuring that we're a part of the decision making and any, any impacts that can affect us, um, like making sure that we're present and then also speaking up. So making sure that you guys are challenging your own beliefs, um, knowing there's a difference between equality and equity um, and letting us figure out um, what we need in that community. This uh, same question will go to uh, Glenn. Okay, I was talking to myself, but everyone said it perfectly. Um, I think what's important is in the workplace to be competent and also be aware of your surroundings, but also acknowledge all the different biases. So for example, I could go into a room and I can insert myself very direct and in passing, but then, you know, when I'm, sometimes, you know, for a man, they could do the same thing, but sometimes we have, we, sometimes we view, we, we are viewed subjectively. So it's like, you know, I could be very calm and direct and a man could be very calm, and direct. We both have the same goal and objective, but he can be seen as very strong and confident. And I can be seen as someone that's very direct or sassy. So just be aware of those biases and acknowledge it right then and there and pinpoint it. I think it's really important. Um, sometimes, you know, we're not really aware of our environment and sometimes we're so focused on what we're doing that we're not really aware. So I just be more mindful. That's the best way to support in the workplace. Those, uh, you two had very good points, especially the whole biases part. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, so the next question will be, is there a glass ceiling in your profession? If so, how do you navigate through a male dominant industry? And if that doesn't pertain to any of you, if there, if that was a situation, how would you advise someone to go about it? Um, so I feel like this would, this first question will go to Rama. Yeah, so in higher ed, there have been a lot of gains made by women now in America, at least more women are getting college educations than men, which is a big deal um, in terms of the change over time. But if we look at who is in academia, there's still a over-representation of men relative to women. And so in some ways there is a glass ceiling still operating and there's also a race ceiling too. Um, the composition of college students has increasingly become more diverse, but the faculty are still not reflecting that. So the biggest thing that I found that, that's been helpful is finding mentors and advisors from your communities, um, women who have gone through academia and navigated the system, Black women, different groups who've really been supportive and encouraging. All right, thank you so much, Rama. Uh, this next question will also go to Mabrat. As I mentioned, I, I work um, in corporate. I actually work for the railroad. So I uh, am responsible for bringing in revenue into my company that basically affects how my organization operates. And when you think of the railroad, you think of white men. It is a white male dominated industry. So there are certainly glass ceilings in just working in the railroad. And I think working in corporate in general, um, the way that I have been able to navigate through the industry is knowing who I am, knowing what I bring to the table and knowing that you know, in spaces, it's my responsibility to take up that space you know, in all of our boldness. I think that is what we are supposed to do. That's what we should be called to do as women, as leaders, uh, as community members. So yes, there definitely are glass ceilings, especially in corporate America, especially in the railroad industry. And I think we have a responsibility to kind of break those ceilings, break those ceilings in our profession and make way for other women to come behind us. Thank you so much, Mabra. It sounds like we've picked a great bunch because you guys are having some really good answers. Um, so next question would be, how have you made a substantial difference in your career field? Um, so this first person, would it would be Hanna. So go ahead and make your point. I think for, I have a little bit of a different um, answer just because it, my career field is a little bit undefined. 
Um, I think the biggest word for me would be entrepreneur um, and culture shifter. And that's not really like, it's, it's such an interesting thing because I get to be as creative as I want, um, but there are people in this lane. So like for media, podcasting, like doing e-commerce and things like that, there's a lane, but there's not enough um, like women from Africa, you know what I mean? That are in this, especially like when I started, like there wasn't enough African representation um, true to the, like the diaspora um, that we could all relate to. Um, so that for me has been like the substantial difference is how do I make this true and authentic to like myself um, while maintaining like <laughs> in this, in, like in this industry and in this field and like navigating that path. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, Betty, take it away. Hey guys, um, well said Hannah. I would say in my workplace, I work in local government, um, very, it's not multicultural. Um, I am the first African person to work there in community development to make change in that space. Um, so I am getting the most like backlash and um, setting the trend for the future. So for me, it's more um, giving, you know, other communities in the area a voice for the first time in local government, um, in my local government. Um, and in my role. So that's been a really interesting change. All right, thank you so much, Betty. Now this next question is actually my favorite question. So describe the importance of having a wise council and what kinds of people are on yours. Now, I really wish we could ask each and every one of you, but obviously for the sake of time, we only have two people. Um, so I'm gonna pick Rama for this first one and then Mavra for the second one. So for me, um, a wise council, is foundational for every movement, every step I've taken beyond um, high school and so on, even in high school, um, because there are a crew of people who have your interests at heart, who want to see you do well, whatever that means, wherever that takes you. Um, so for me, I think at each stage of my life, I've had different people who've fallen into that position, like teachers, you know, community members, family members, friends, but then also professionals that I've worked with and mentors from my old job and in graduate school that I still can rely on um, who knew me when and who can give me advice when there's something I'm not sure about. And I play that role to those two who are uh, below me who are just starting out too. I, I agree with Rama. I think um, having a wise counsel is so important. It's like having your own personal board of directors and that may change depending on you know your season in life. So for me, the, the people who are in my wise council or my board of directors include some of my best friends from childhood who have grown up with me and who can check me when I'm out of line or tell me when I need to keep it moving or tell me if I, you know, you're better than this. You, you are fantastic, you know, show up in all your glory. And then you have those individuals who can be as your mentors, like Rama said, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about applying for this job. Can you help me with my resume? Can we practice doing interviewing skills? You know, having those individuals in your circle that can really help you through every season of life, I think is truly important. Um, and I advise everyone to try to find, you know, who's that core group of people that you trust that uh, you can depend on, that uh, they can depend on you for, that can offer you wise counsel, which is exactly that. Um, so I, I definitely have a board of directors in my life that I'm grateful for that help me navigate just life in, in all its twists and turns. So it's very important. All right, thank you so much, uh, ladies. So now we're, we're, we're over the generic questions. So now we're gonna kind of go into the more personal, more uh, questions geared to their professions. Um, so this next question will be for Hannah. Uh, so Hannah, tell me about, or tell us about what inspired you to create your podcast, Uprooted, and what did you want your listeners to gain from it? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but essentially like I am, you know, heavy into media and I just didn't feel like I saw myself anywhere. Um, I saw like black women, of course, and I identify that way. But I think that the experience of a first generation um, like immigrant in this country, and then to be from such a small region, you know, where 
people didn't even know like that we existed you know what I mean so it's hard to connect that way and there's um, a similarity across the East African diaspora of like shared experience and history um, it's difficult to navigate and there's such a process of like trying to learn who you are as a person when you've been removed from your roots so that's where uprooted comes from um, it's this idea that like let's share space let's get to know one each other one another and like what what was that journey like for you like how can we help each other learn and grow um that's really like the goal of uprooted and hopefully like exposing people especially the people coming under us um to also like be able to be just have role models that we didn't have all right hannah thank you so much uh so this next question will be geared towards betty um or just kidding um so Hannah, we're still on Hannah. So you've been featuring various Tigrayan women worldwide on your hashtag Black Women Wednesday segment, ranging from activists, people who have been adopted, those promoting self-healing, et cetera. So why has this been your focal point and explain the significance for the Tigaru community to see these one-on-ones? Yeah, thank you. I, I really want to center us. I really want to center women. I really feel like we're we do so much. We are the backbone of our communities um, and we don't often take credit. Like there's a humbleness to us and it's just like upsetting, you know, like I'm like, no, you guys do so much. You deserve more than this and you deserve to take your flowers, you know, like it's fine. Like, you know, you should be like, I'm just trying to shift that culture. And I also want to shift this idea that you have to be this spe spectacular, amazing person to do good or to have, you know, like your story is still important. Like, it doesn't mean that, you know, like you have to look up to celebrities, you can look to your left and your right. And like, you don't even know that this amazing person is standing right next to you with an entire story. So I'm trying to like really break this idea um, that, you know, that you have to be someone like, no, you already are someone. And like, I want you to live in your truth. And I want you to feel comfortable sharing that and take up space in the world because we live in a world that tells us as a black woman that we don't matter. Um, and I really want to change that for everyone else that we do. Um, and, and that's the goal. And for Tagata women, especially, um, that plays such a big role as, you know, we said earlier in the program, like we literally carry the entire culture. Um, we are the ones that are leading this entire revolution. Um, so I don't want to go back to like a past where we weren't in the forefront and where we weren't centered and, where our stories are hidden and not told. So that's the goal of doing this. And hopefully it inspires others to like start to speak their truth and, and own their story. All right, well said, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, so the next uh, panelist will be Betty. Uh, so Betty, tell us, you know, what has been your biggest challenge while advocating? What did, and I, I know this is a three-parter. What advice do you have for Tagados who want to get involved but have felt uncomfortable in speaking out due to their fear of being judged by their peers? Thank you, Bevan. Um, sorry, shout out to Hannah. That was a, a great response beforehand. Um, for me, the biggest challenge has been um, having no days off. Um, this is very personal. It's affecting our people and our family. Um, so I, I found it really hard to disconnect and kind of have me time to focus on my mental health. Um, and also having people silence and counter. Um, it's hard enough trying to get support, raise awareness and get people to know what's happening in today. But now to you know go against the people that are countering or silent has been really challenging. Um, so I have to like remind myself every single day that the people that are you know, showing hate crime um, or comments don't represent their people. Um, you know, 80% of Ethiopia is in rural, in the rural area. So um, having that reminder every day makes me feel a lot better. Um, but in terms of having fear to speak out, um, understand why we're speaking out and why it's really important. Um, you know, the people back home, especially our youth, they're going into the war selflessly, bravely um, and sacrificing their life. So for us to speak up, it's really important. And when I hear stories like um, Hewitt and Rowena, um, both Australian from the UK, when they came here, you know, their foreign passports, having the Australian passport and having the UK passport did not help them. Um, they were Tigrayan, like we are going through a genocide. And, you know, regardless, if you were back home, you'd be one of the people like impacted. Um, so yeah, remembering that every day. Um, and if you're defending your identity um, and you're afraid to do so, 
uh, the people around you really appears. Well, that was deep. Thank you for that. Um, so kind of piggybacking on that. So describe the backlash that you may have received while advocating for people um, and how do you approach or overcome this and how do you think gender affects the way activism is received? So, if, you know, for me, if people come at me personally, I think that I don't tend to take that as personal. Um, it's more when they're coming, like my family and my friends to get to me. Um, I also think if we're talking about gender, um, I find that it's like another young black woman angry about society. So when I'm like being advocate, or when I'm advocate, I'm advocate when I'm advocating online, um, I feel like, pen, like people tend to move aside because I'm also quite young. Um, and you know, even within the community, um, even if I'm chairing the community at the time, um, the parents tend to go to you know the boys that are in their thirties. Um, so I'm always like having to work extra hard. Um, so for me, I've like let my work and my passion kind of talk for itself. Um, yeah, but also I've heard this story recently, like literally last night and you know, these, I won't say from what ethnic group, these seven boys came and, um, you know, they were coming very verbal to, to Grawitis and, you know, they wouldn't say that to the males. And like, even the DMs messages we're getting, like it's most of the females that are getting this, they can't come up to us and hit us in the face. So for them, it's like they use their words. Um, so it's really important that the men in our community are protecting the women um, and we're standing in solidarity. It's a very good point. Um, now, turning now to Bilen, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted people in various ways, one of them being their mental health. Um, what advice do you have to those who are struggling with isolation, the fear of being laid off, getting COVID, et cetera? I think the number one thing is to stay, to stay physically safe from the virus. So whatever you're able to do, whatever within your control, try to stay safe as possible. Um, identify what you can do within your control and try to refrain from doing things in your control. So it's like, try to, I know it's really difficult. I know some of us don't want to be in isolation. I know some of us are so used to going outside, doing things so freely, but at the same time is your health is really important, the effects of it, your loved ones around it. So keep that in mind and also um, limit media and re reduce anxiety. I know sometimes you really just want to get online just to see what's going on or really concern, but also be mindful what's that doing to you and your mental health. Sometimes just seeing graphic videos, 10 hours a day or seeing images. Yes, we want to see what's going on, but also that's affecting us. It may show up later down the line, but try to reduce that as much as possible. Um, creating a new routine. We're, as humans, we naturally want to have control. Um, one example of this pandemic, you know, we're all were buying toilet paper at some point because that's something we could do in our control. But try to have a routine, practice healthy behaviors, um, rituals, something for yourself. Try to have like a predictable activity. Our brains um, want to, pre to be predictable, predictable as much as possible. And also try to relax your nervous system. Um, identify your support system that can be your friends and your family. Sometimes you try to internalize a lot of things, but I think it's really beneficial if you at least write it down or at least have one identical person that you can actually speak to. Um, watching or like scrolling through media makes us even more anxious. So try to reduce media in general, um, especially with the like the like traumatic events and um it actually can create like a lot of like symptoms for yourself if you keep having this exposure. All right, thank you, Blen. You kind of asked, answered your next question. Uh, so not only has the pandemic been a concern, but so has the Tigray conflict that has displaced tens of thousands and has killed thousands of Ethiopians in the Tigray region. So what are some ways for Tigarus who have been directly or indirectly affected by the war can manage their, their mental health by advocating to end the war? Okay, one thing I wanna like touch on is that uh, to remember that everyone reacts differently to trauma and each person has their own tolerance when it comes to those difficult feelings. And so, um, it's common to have like a difficult time managing those feelings during time of war and threat or traumatic events. 
Um, it's going to be to the point, like I said, everyone handles it differently. But when it comes to a point where it's actually interfering with your normal daily functioning, um, that's something that you really need to like look into. When those feelings do not go away, when it's starting to bother or like affect your sleep pattern, think of it like what is normal to you? Normal could be different for me. Normal could be different for you. Notice if you're not able to stop thinking about the sport or the traumatic event. Um, if you're noticing that you're having avoidance, avoiding the thoughts, avoiding the feelings, if you notice that you're not yourself, I think just be very mindful of those type of things when it comes to yourself. And, you know, everyone has different ways of coping, but just be mindful is, is your coping healthy for you? Is it benefiting you? Just be very mindful, but also see what creativity that you could do for yourself. Talk about it. Um, talking to others, relieve stress. Uh, what are ways that you like to relieve stress? Realize what others are sharing in their feelings. Take care of yourself. What is that gonna be like for you? What do you like to do? Um, have plenty of rest, exercise. Um, also too, um, and I noticed this too, where I'm eating more every time I'm anxious, uh, just uh, physically, just see, you know, am I eating more? Am I eating less? Um, am I having more alcohol than usual? Little things like that. Limit, please limit the exposure of those images. Um, like I said, we really, really want to know what's going on, but it's also harming us at the end. And then also, um, you know, rituals, but also too with advocating. Like I said, do what you can do in your control. Do something positive. You know, what are you able to do in your community? Um, even one tweet. I know you don't want to see those images, so maybe tweet something. Um, what are you able to pass on? You can text, you can write signs, you can give money. Do what you're able to do and do what you're able to feel comfortable doing. There's many different ways where you you can help, but also you're not harming yourself. And also acknowledge what you're doing. You may feel like you're not doing enough, but you're actually doing a lot. A little goes a long way and always give yourself credit in what you're doing. And also ask for help. It's okay if you need help. We all need help. I need help all the time. Um, it's not a sign of weakness, you know? And also talk with a trusted relative, friend, um, someone in the community, church. Um, if you feel like it's really, really affecting you, I really do suggest you seek professional help. All right, Belen, thank you so much for that. Also, if, uh, those of you who are just joining the uh, Dallas CPN for the first time, Belen actually went into depth on mental health back in February, and we will actually have that information, that full video on our Instagram. All right, so our next panelist is Mavrat. So Mavrat, you are one of many Tigrayan women who have remained a constant voice of reason during the war. What has been your motivation and what do you hope the Tigrayan community takes from the last few months? I know that it's been extremely hard for all of us just experiencing uh, this crisis over the past five months, um, almost five months. And I think the what what keeps me motivated or you know what I hope communities take from this activism is that as Hannah said, it's it's been a whole revolution. It's been so beautiful to just see all of us come together literally across North America globally uh, just to fight for peace for our people. And so what keeps me going is seeing my sisters who were in DC and New York, you know, just a couple days ago, protesting, taking to the streets, um, hearing those horrific stories of women being raped back home as a result of the war. All of this motivates me to keep going and it encourages me because, um, you know, I, I may come as one, but I stand as 10,000, right? That's what Maya Angelou said. Like we, we may come as one individual, I'm just my brat, but I'm standing like all Tigrayan women here fighting for peace and making sure that we recognize our voice and that we use our voice that we take up space and we continue to, you know, just move in this revolution. Um, and I really hope that all of us who are taking action and fighting for peace, that we recognize um, this is just the beginning. We, we have a long road ahead of us to build. 
And I encourage all of us to stay involved, get involved in your local community. If there isn't one, create one, create an opportunity for us to serve, to work together, to build Little Tigray here in North America so that we can then also translate that to back home. Um, so that would be what I, I hope folks take away from just this crisis. Let's move from crisis to peace and action and rebuilding. Thank you, Mabrat. And your last question would be, so how do you inspire the next wave of women leaders from your role on the TPN national team? So I'm, I'm very passionate, as some of my sisters know, I'm very passionate about uh, community development. I'm very passionate about our community. And what I hope, uh, you know, I, I hope that I can inspire people just in the way that I move. I want to always show up as my authentic self. I want to always recognize that I can have all the things and I want other women to know that as well. So move confidently, know that we can have all the things, that we can take up space, that women run the world. You know, if you think of that song, you know, who run the world, that is us. And I, uh, I hope that we recognize our power as women uh, and that we walk in that. So that's, that's what I hope uh, to kind of be an example of for women everywhere, it doesn't matter what age, so that we recognize our divine, we recognize our glory, we recognize how wonderful we are as women. Well said, thank you, Marat. Uh, so our next questions go to uh, our next panelist, Rama. So Rama, this is a two-parter. What are some consequences innocent civilians, namely women, have faced from the interactions of different ethnic groups? And then also, what impact do we expect to see as a result in the next 10 years? Thank you, Fevin. Yeah, these are both two difficult and sad questions to think about. So the first, if we think about the consequences of what's happening right now, um, it's important to contextualize, thinking back to what Froini said at the beginning of um, the marginalization of Tigrayans in Ethiopia is not a new phenomenon. And even before the war, there were reports of rising ethnic tensions, ethnic discrimination against Tigrayans in Ethiopia. And we can see that war is a manifestation of these um, tensions. But then there have been these reports of mass murders, um, ethnic, all kinds of ethnic violence, maiming, abuse, and specifically for women, reports of rapes, um, mass rapes. And so if we think about this from a social demography perspective, all of this violence coupled with increased out migration from Tigray, people who are claiming refugees and asylee status, raises concerns about population loss for Tigray. So if we're thinking about the future in the next 10 years, there will need to be a lot of development and growth and rebuilding of Tigray. Um, and that will require both social capital, but also people, manpower, you know, people who are there doing the work, laying the ground. And so that, that's important to think about. Um, and so I do a lot of like demography stuff, thinking about population growth, birth rate, death rate, Right now there's increased mortality, right? More people are dying than normal, but also because of the instability, the violence, it's likely that birth rates have been affected too. And so um, moving forward, it's important to think about what the implications will be for the population size for Tigray and how that will translate into the political implications because we are already a minority group in Ethiopia. Well said, thank you so much, Rama. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the Q&A. So we've already asked the questions to the panelists. So now those of you who are watching, send us your questions either through the Facebook Live link or even through um, Zoom. We'll give you guys a chance to kind of send those in and then we'll just kind of start throwing those questions out. And also uh, please specify if you have it, if you want it, you know, to, reach out to all the panelists or if it just be a certain one, make sure you specify that in your question as well. Or maybe the panelists answered everything that you guys wanted to hear. <laughs> Um, 
Oh, okay. Here goes one from uh, Saad, and then this could be geared towards anyone. So, what's the best advice you've ever received? Okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> I, the one, okay, the one that I can remember. I don't know if it's the best, but the one that I can remember is remember why you started. Um, that like life is going to be difficult. There are going to be times where you want to give up, where you want to quit. Um, everybody and their mama is driving you nuts. Yes, it happens, you know? And you have to decide, right? Like, what is the point here? Like, why am I doing this? And then that's like always helped me like continue to move forward, um, especially in the last like four going on five months. I'm like, wait, what? Why am I doing this again? Is this helping to guy? Is it not helping to guy? You know, um, because sometimes we get, you know, ideas and stuff and then you just keep running and then you forget. So that that's really helped me stay centered. And I'd like to add one or two. That's a great point, Hanna. I know one of the uh, pieces of advice that I've received is, you know, don't don't sweat, sweat the small stuff, right? And then saying that it's all small stuff. So I think it just helps me put things in perspective of what really matters. Um, and, and don't, you know, carry on worrying. I think that stress can really have an effect on you and recognizing what really matters in life. That's the best advice I've received. I like to say that you'll be surprised on the different type of strength that you carry while doing so. So you may think that, you know, I can't do this. I'm not exactly sure, but there's five other strengths that you just identified. So I think that's also um, one thing that you should like identify as well. Yeah, I think going back to what Hanna and Mabat said, um, I always think back to words like that my mother and father would always say would be like, uh, remember who you are and where you come from and that what's happening doesn't define you. Um, is always a stabilizing moment when I'm in the middle of something and feel like, Stan, this is it. I'm, I'm not good at what I'm doing, whatever. It's the remember who you are and where you come from. Um, also, just add on to that because they're all great points. Um, like you can't control like external factors, but you can control how it impacts you. Has been like a really good, really good advice. All right, well said. Thank you for you all ch uh, chiming in on that one. Um, this next question is: What's a piece of advice you would give to your younger self? I don't know if everybody else had this reaction, but I was like, girl, don't buy that outfit. That was like the first. That was the first <laughs> That's thing. a good one. <laughs> right? That was the first thing I thought of. I was like, oh, child, like, you thought that was cute. Um, but I think it's actually what Betsy said. Betsy, that was a really good point. And it was this idea, right, that um, we, like, we just hold on to a lot of stuff, you know, that's really not that important. Um, I think you were saying that, too. So it was like it. The things that you think are going to be so like important to you when you're that age, you're not even going to remember it. Um, so what I've changed my like perspective to, and, and this might sound morbid to you guys, but one of my psych teachers taught me this is like on a scale of life and death, like how important is this? You know what I mean? Like zero to the death, like, is this something that you really need to carry? Um, and when you put it in that perspective, you're like, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, to echo on what um oh sorry um no just to echo what Hannah just said um like if it's not important in like a year or five years from now um are you going to care about it so that in mind if I could tell my younger self something I would probably tell her like slow down I think when we're younger we always feel like you have to rush to the next thing like I can't wait till I turn 16 I can't wait till I turn 26 like you know I I would tell my younger self to just slow down and really enjoy every single day I think I would have told myself to care less about what other people think I think my younger self took 
other people's opinions more seriously than maybe I needed to. And that took some time to unlearn. Wow, these are all really good tidbits. Um, so this next question is for Betty. So Betty, what are some similarities or differences you've seen in the level or type of advocating in Australia versus other countries? I would say the unity is probably the same. Um, that is in our culture. So like the unity between Tsugadal and Perth, Australia um, or globally, um, and our dedication is the same. Advocacy in Australia is really difficult because we don't have a lot of representation in higher places. Um, so even like we've gone through a genocide in Australia as well. So we've had to tackle it from a different angle. Um, you, you know, organizations that have power. So it's been a lot harder with, I guess the government per se, um, who won't even give the indigenous Australians rights. So we've had to tackle it from a different angle in comparison to like, you know, the Europe or America who can go directly to MPs. Well said, thank you, Betty. Um, now this next question is to Mavrat. So Mavrat, how do you think we can maintain a strong connection as a community in the diaspora after the crisis in, uh, after the crisis in Tigray ends? Do you think it will be difficult? What challenges do you foresee in the future? That's a great question. Um, first thing I would say is let's think on peace now. This crisis is not going to last. Peace is coming to our people. Peace is coming to Tigray. So I think the way we need to try to maintain that strong connection is just get involved, Con continue doing the work that we're doing now. Um, I don't think it's going to be difficult. Um, if you think about where we were when this war first started, I think everyone's emotions were just thinking, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And if you think about it almost five months later, look at all that we've done. You know, the, in the United States, we have senators who have passed resolutions uh, fighting for peace in Tigray. Uh, we have taken over social media as digital Wayani and have made such a huge impact in doing that. So no, it's not, it's not going to be difficult. Um, I think what we also have to recognize is yes, our emotions are high. We are very sensitive people, but let's think about our skill sets. Let's think about what we can bring uh, to build our community and let's utilize that. That is how we are going to continue to be successful. And sorry, guys, that's my dog in the background. Sounds like the dog wanted to share his ideas as well. <laughs> Thank you, Mabrat. Um, so we still have a little more time. Uh, we're actually like right on schedule. So if anybody has more questions to kind of put in there, feel free. Um, otherwise, we'll just move on to the closing remarks. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds or something. While we wait for questions, I just wanted to also say, um, Mabrat, that was a really good point. Um, I, I really hope everyone, I'm exhausted, obviously, from DC and New York. Uh, the protests were a lot of work. Um, so shout out to the organizers of that. But what I want to say, too, is the feeling that I had from actually being able to experience it was like we're we're literally making history like and and just understand that, like, we're such a small nation. But look, like that protest was insane. Like there's thousands of Tagaros, you know what I mean, that flew out because like it mattered, you know, and if they can just hold on to that power of like, look at what you can accomplish when you get out of your own way. Like when you stop thinking about all of those other things and you just show up, you just show up and you just do the work. Um, we don't have to go back to thinking we're not powerful. Like we don't have to go back to thinking we don't have a voice and we don't have to go back to thinking that um, the numbers matter because there's countries bigger than us that don't stand up for their people the way we stand up for our people. So if you can hold on to that, then rebuilding should be easy. <laughs> okay, you see, move around with it. Yes. So I just hope y'all take that. Well said, well said. Um, we'll give you guys maybe a few seconds. Otherwise, we'll move on to closing remarks. Wow, we are on time. Sorry, just to go off um, again, what Hannah just said, um, 
I would say like growing up with, you know, his stories like Marta, um, you know, who's like a huge inspiration to a lot of the women around the world and um, Tagato community, but um, being a part of it has been really nice. Like not just having to watch from afar, um, but knowing we're making um, a lot of impact. And yes, we're not fighting physically, um, but the fight online is equally as time consuming and can be very draining. Thank you so much, Betty. All right, well, it looks like you guys are all questioned out. So we're gonna go on to the closing remarks. Um, we're actually gonna share what brings, what's gonna happen next month. So next month, obviously, is the month of April. Definitely join us for our quarterly meeting with DTPN. Um, our guest speaker will be Takesta Gabrasalase. Um, so he'll be talking about investments in Africa and tourism. Obviously, he's gonna be focusing on um, Ethiopia. He's actually a Tigray native himself. Um, that meeting will be on Sunday, April 25th for the addition to our speaker series. And also, if you see the, um, the information on your screen, you can connect with TPN. There's an email info at tagadupn.com. And then also connect with Dallas TPN, which is Dallas TPN at Gmail. You can also follow us on Instagram. TT, uh, TPN also has their own Instagram page as well. You can find them on there. And don't forget to connect. Also, if the panelists can maybe drop your uh, maybe contact information if you feel or um, maybe the people who want to connect with you guys can maybe email us and then we can kind of connect you guys through there. So, all right, well, Michael, it's all yours. Awesome. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. That was uh, a lot of good tidbits. So I know I'm going to go back and watch the recording and, and um, try to make sure I remember all of this because it's a lot of information. But um, other than that, just want to say, you know, thanks. Happy International Women's Day Month. And then you all have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the great work you're doing, everybody. Good job. you guys. Bye.